my name's Hakapa Here, and this is um, Eden Brown. We are colleagues at Extreme Waste. <laughs> How long have you guys been with me? Eden. Ten months. Ten months? Yeah, I've been on and off for about a year and a half. Did you both grow up here or you grew up here? Yep. yep. You used to go in the same class. Born and bred. Yeah. <laughs> and so, did I hear you say you were born in 96? 96. So Extreme Waste has probably been here for as long as you can remember. All my life. <laughs> do you guys know the story? Do they tell, do you kind of hear about how they started? No, Can't say I do. They didn't even have a shop when they started. Yeah, they? they didn't have most of the stuff. They had. An I old... think they had a hole. I think they had a hole. Yeah, I think yeah, just one big yeah, hole. They had a hole. Recycling is a labour intensive industry and we're happy for that and we don't want to swap people for machines. You've got a few eco geeks here, you know. <laughs> it's not just their nine to five, it's like what they're committed to in the world. Here at Extreme Waste we're all employees, we all receive a hourly wage and any profits go back into further developing the business. We um, take waste um, products like oil and toxic waste as well, free from the community so that they're not pouring it down the drains. It's a very important side of Extreme Waste. We've got a clean as town, <laughs> the cleanest town, we get all the comments back to us from the public, they'll just stop us and just say, oh thanks, you're doing a mean job. Very, very simply, 75% diversion is, you know, right in the top 5% of performers anywhere in the, in the world. And the secret to your success, without a shadow of a doubt, is the fact that you are a community organisation and you know, of the community, for the community. There's, there's ownership here. It's very, very obvious in everything that you do. Sometimes I think as a human race, we haven't really evolved that far. Like a cow or a sheep, we step forward and munch on what's ahead of us poop on what's behind of us and just keep moving forwards. Waste is often regarded as an engineering issue. However, we feel it's a social issue that demands changes in actions and changes in perceptions. There are two ways to affect change. You can enforce it with laws and regulations or you can inspire change from within the community with events like a recycled trolley race down the steepest street in town. Stream Waste and Raglan Community presents for the third year running a famous full-on fun recycled trolley derby. I expected oh, maybe 20 people would show up and man, the whole town showed up for it. You know, we had, it was lined. Trolleys must be made using at least 80% recycled materials and all racers must wear covered footwear, motorbike helmets. And the people were saying you know, it was such a great thing to see fathers and, and sons and fathers and kids working together to do something. First year we didn't have any hay bales, we didn't have anything, so we were lucky nobody ran into the crowd. Three years we ran it and we managed, we broke one leg. They're away. Children, please stay away from the road. There's a race in progress. No crossing the road now. The 
first um, inkling that you know this would be good for the Raglan community was when I went to see Eva Rickard, who's a local person. Most people remember her for the land struggles here in Raglan and they, with the golf course. I went to see her to talk about um, fisheries in the harbour and she was um, saying yes that would be wonderful to have your support to work on the fisheries, improve the fishery and the first job for you to do would be to improve the water quality by closing the dump, recycle as much as you can and stop the leachate from coming down into the, into the harbour. If she had it in her head that something needed to be done and you were going to the person who was going to have to do it, well, you had to do it pretty much. <laughs> so she was an amazing person, I think a real visionary. A lot of people would think, well, we really want recycling, so we'll just petition the council. Mm. Do you know why you didn't go down that route? Recycling as a concept was very new in New Zealand in the end of, um, end of that century. So I think we just knew that a lot of energy would be spent trying to get the council to do it. Um, and we felt that Raglan, we could do it ourselves. Around about the same time came along a meeting, a town meeting. With Gerard Gillespie. Gerard Gillespie. Gerard Gillespie. Gerard Gillespie um, down to talk about zero waste. And that was the first time that I had really heard about um, the concept. He was a very inspirational man and I remember one of the first terms he used um, was, you know, waste only exists between the ears. And uh, I sort of took that on board quite a bit, you know. They were really intensely interested in the whole idea and, and they just took it up and ran with it. So we started to have meetings of our own. There was two sort of types of people within the group. Um, there, was, there was the ones that wanted to do something and there was the ones that enjoyed to talk about doing something. Yeah, the majority of those people um, didn't turn up to pick up paper and cardboard and um, it, it was a frustration. Let's just get up and do it, you know. I was just driving through town and Rick sort of waved me in because I'd just finished a year, you know, finished all my years at Polytech and Rick said to me, look, you know, what are you doing next year? Well, you know, and I said, well, I don't know. Well, why don't you come and pick paper up for free with us? <laughs> Whatever Rick was up to, I'm kind of always interested in. And everyone that, that was involved, I kind of knew. And you had a van. And I had a van. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. what he didn't say was, can, can you jam your whole van yeah. right up to the ceiling and only have enough room for yourself in it? At that time we were homeschooling and we, along with our children, um, they got involved and we just used our own personal vans and trailers. Once a month, every second Tuesday of the month, the people would put the paper out. And and the kids would be out there running and, you know, jumping all over the paper and having great fun. The old, the, the co-mater in town, you know, were really supportive and loved the fact that these kids were picking up the paper and just the energy of it was really satisfying. vans to our windows and just jamming it in and there was these little submarines driving along the road with just enough room left for the driver and then The level of what council would call professionalism or polish wasn't necessarily there with the extreme waste folk. Yeah. Yeah, they they um, didn't present a corporate culture which isn't surprising because that's not who they were, you know, but that's what council was expecting. We really struggled um, with the engineer at the time. I think he just would um, prefer to have um, a landfill or a transfer station. How was the council at the time, the, the, the local council? Well, <clears throat> most, like, this is going back a number of years. It's comprehensive, complete recycling programs weren't mainstream by any means. And so still a lot of uncertainty, um, almost, why take a risk? Council staff and some of the elected people struggled with the motivation of um, the Extreme Waste crew. Which, which part of the, the motivation? I mean, they wanted to do some good stuff. Why? Why would you want to? Why do they want to do that? Why? I mean, they're not going to make any money, 
Sick of waiting for things to happen with council, the group decided to start picking up paper and cardboard in Raglan on a volunteer basis. Little did they know that their volunteer work would last for two years. You all right then, financially, for those two years? Absolutely not. It was a, a total backward trend. Shared meals, <laughs> looking after each other. Yeah, it was a lot of that. Growing our own food here on the land uh, made it possible. It was certainly a challenging time, like, gosh, why, you know, standing in the middle of the pouring rain, ripping open cardboard boxes, just, you know, by hand to flatten them and stuff. Your family's out at home, you've, you've got hardly any money, your vehicle's not registered, you know, and it's, and it's like, what, what the hell am I doing? You know, inside me was like, no, this is a, this is a good cause. You know, this is something I, at home my family sort of, well, well, Dad, you spend a lot of time away from home and we're not getting any money. The old Raglan dump was due to close in July of 1999 and the group was trying to convince the council to let them take over the new transfer station. It was looking really positive that we were going to get the contract and at the very last minute, council came in and changed their mind. No, no, we didn't feel like giving up. We were just, we were just let down, and we're still fun, and we're still a real buzz. In the end, it was okay because it gave us a bit more time to, to organise ourselves. Yeah, in in retrospect, <laughs> it would have been we probably weren't ready. The dump was closed in July 1999, and Donald Melgren Transport was given the contract to run the new transfer station. The recycling team was allowed just a little corner of the site within which to continue their mission. We didn't have any power, we only had a little cage in the corner of that uh, transfer station area. We'd sort of pull up there and Wayne Petro, <laughs> Wayne Petro had just, had just pushed all the stuff, his plastic, his, his cardboard, his racks, his everything. Yeah, and just throw it all in there, it was supposed to only cardboard, so on cardboard only, and we just did the whole lot. You'd say, well, stuff you guys, and you wouldn't listen to us. Rick was working with council, he was certainly one of the more um, even keeled members of the group in terms of being, you know, diplomatic and all the rest of it. And PJ was a bit of a hothead. PJ would suddenly um, come firing in and almost frighten the guys at um, council with, um, with his energy. So when I reflect back on it, you know, I think the sort of um, having the two processes working in, in parallel was probably the thing that got us through in the end. We were always considered you know, the whangaroa hippies or whatever. Yeah, hippies, hippies, greeny hippies, um, you know, and not, not really to be taken seriously. So that was, we, we were serious, you know. <laughs> we weren't playing around and we put our whole lives into it. We would make submissions around the recycling to the district council. The um, chief executive was particularly rude. And made an aside comment that unfortunately was heard by the rest of the room about check out the, I'm not sure if he, what he called them exactly, but in the, in his, in the pajamas. Rick was wearing um, some fairly loose pants, not, not really happy clothes at all, but you know, he wasn't wearing a suit and tie. It generally encapsulated the disrespect well, to me anyway, it encapsulated the disrespect that the um, council staff um, felt for extreme waste. That was the CEO, um, the CEO of Waikato District Council, Warwick Bennett at the time. Yeah, he didn't support it and um, um, he was, yeah, openly, I, I would say he was even quite hostile. He always said Whangaro is a town full of um, activists and they're always pushing for something. He 
and said, you know, that wasn't appropriate to be doing recycling. He didn't believe in it. He would often ridicule us in public meetings and some um, in meetings at council. Mm. Yeah, he now works for an Indonesian logging firm. Extreme Waste, a community initiative, invite you on a journey to establish a waste management system for Raglan community that is based on the principles of zero waste. Our target, to reduce Raglan's waste disposed to landfill by 75% by June 30, 2003. It was a great kaupapa. It, it, you know, we were enthusiastic about it, but we needed to know that we could work together, we could trust each other and that there was enough energy combined of all of us so it didn't feel like a burden on just one person. So that, at that stage that was two, Hannah and I, PJ, Rick and Liz and Pinny Campbell. And I think that's been a beautiful thing with Extreme Waste is that it's been a, a collection of people um, um, sharing the responsibility. from you know what we were wearing or not wearing and so we decided to give it one last flick eh? and we put suits on and ties and, and went along to the council meeting I think they were really concerned so they were really worried you know we were we changed um, and somewhere we have a photograph of that Pisa, Nuttall and Rick wearing suits looking very buoyant like they are going to get it Anyway, right, we probably right the way through till just about the end of the second year, we actually had to refinance our mortgage to be able to survive that last little process through to contract time. Only weeks before we were due to get it, there was actually a scare that it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, we were all prepared. We worked two years, and even this, is, this was the fickleness of council at the time. Basically, it was the town, the support from the town, the emails from the town, the, the phone calls from the... the town members to the council that got us in that door. That's what I say about community support. Community support won the day, that particular day. With petrols, with the council, we just carried on anyway because we knew our kaupapa was good. And you realise you're on a good kaupapa, you can't go wrong with it. Raft race is your raft has got to be at least 80% recycled, um, no engines, uh, no sail assist, and you've got to do it in the spirit of love and fun. It's about bringing together people and bringing no together waste. the concept of zero waste and doing that with fun and love and passion. So we've used some surfboards that were too broken to surf on again. We've got some plastic barrels in the middle there. This is actually a hot water cylinder. It's all corrugated iron. Totally recycled, really old, bit rusty, but we've got a lot of silicon. We've got tyres from Raglan Engineering. They're going to go back there. The fridge that we picked up from Extreme, and it's super buoyant. What's it made of? A bath and a windsurf board. Have you got the plug in the bath? Um, How do you think you'll do today? Oh, we're just hoping it doesn't sink. <laughs> um, it's, I think it might float for about five seconds at least. <laughs> I know this raft race is not about winning, but someone's got to win it, so hopefully that's us. On your marks! Get set! Go! Mama came, my sister's Tani came, we did a karakia around the site, a wairea karakia, which is a, a, a clearing of the space, and a karakia to establish the intention. We wanted to firmly acknowledge a change in activity, a change in presence and a restoration of um, that land and the water quality. First day that I, part that I remember was 
maybe six o'clock in the morning up on the old dump site and I remember standing on that hump looking back at the, the site and thinking what have I got myself into. And just exciting to be with those people as well and they're really you know really lovely people and good friends. There were people who were holding back their rubbish because they felt so strongly that they didn't want to put it in another hole at Horotiu. So <laughs> on our first day of opening, there was so much stuff, you know, because people had backlogged. It was amazing that the community did, did support us so well very early on in year one, you know, they, they really did. That, that was a, a great surprise. You felt like you were initiating stuff, but after a while you began to realise that we didn't have ownership of it. In actual fact, it really was being more and more owned by the community. And I think that the key thing to that was the education process. We, you know, we produced really fabulous um, annual reports. Annual reports are traditionally drab and boring, but we wanted it to really reflect our community. 96.6 FM. Whoa, this is a sick 1960s pub mic a table. This is bad. Check this place out. There's curtains, lampshades, blankets, crockery, gardening tools. Reusable building materials, fishing gear, mulch, firewood, hardware, car parts, coming equipment. Kahu's Nest, up at the recycling centre, Tihutiwai Road. It's all good. PJ's partner Marie was the first person to make a little shop area. That was special for us as well to all be involved with, with our kids. Yeah, it made an amazing kind of family feeling. A lot of extreme waste first employees came from WINS employment schemes and some couldn't read while others would lie about their work skills at their job interview. Many people were surprised when extreme waste didn't just fire them as soon as they found out. One of the things you, you've got to recognise is that it's not a glamour job, you know, and heck, it's got no money in it, you know, but it is a really necessary job so it's a way, it's a thinking around that that we, we need to be honourable to the people who are actually going to end up doing this job and they're going to, um, they're going to have a different set of needs but they're going to be really important to the success of this. I guess I was a little bit scared to, um, to play boss really and, and do the, say the hard, harsh things that you needed to say at times, you know, it took me a bit of, bit of work to, to get through that. If it was like Rick, and you said, oh, I think you have to go and let this person go. And he'd go, oh, yeah, OK, OK, I'll do it. And he'd come back and he said, I told him he was a really good worker. I'd look at my beautiful friends as, you know, trying to run this business in the best possible flat, um, flat management way in the world, and there were boys there just taking the piss. And you could see it. But the fact is that they understood that, but they knew that if they continued to provide them with the, with the respect and the love and the job and the money and the incentive to do what they do, it'll come back. It'll come around. You know? And you know it did. How does it compare working here compared to other places? Cruisy has been. Yes, way better. Yeah? Cruisy. Yeah. Have you guys worked anywhere else? Yeah, I've done painting. Oh, I've yeah. done bricklaying. Yeah. 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 Because the new guys are going to crack all the jokes about you, you're going you're gonna to get bum boyed around and everything. Yeah. But it just comes with job, eh? It's all good. But do you get that here? Nah. No way. We have tried to improve the wages of the guys as much as we can. You know, it's tight, but, you know, we do try to do that because it's a hard, physical, dirty, noisy job, you know? You're dealing with food waste and people's rubbish and nappies and sharp metal and a whole lot of horrible things, you know, that everyone still relates to as trash and they just don't want to see it. People, you know, they applaud us for the, the job, but then they go, oh, yuck, you're, you're in your hands and I'm doing it all. And 
And what they don't realise is their shit we're picking up, so we're not the ones making it. When they first got the contract, the team had minimal experience in waste and recycling and almost no money. Because of that, a nervous Waikato District Council only committed to a one-year contract, which in turn meant that they couldn't even raise a loan to buy the equipment they needed. What I remember is getting a grant from Zero Waste Trust, yeah. which was just enough to buy us the things we needed, yeah. but especially the truck. They were also gifted a compactor machine, which made a huge difference to their lives. We'd been ripping boxes up and jumping up and down on them. <laughs> With your we had dreams about like inviting 20 people up just so they could jump yeah. over the bin. So to have this machine that squashed it up into these 100 kilo bales, was like, wow, this is magic. <laughs> yeah, DJ's first bale he made with that thing, he overdid it. This bale came out of plastic bottles. We were sitting there all giving high fives and then the next minute we heard this funny noise, a cracking, crinkly noise, you know. And then next thing the whole bale just popped in there and bottles everywhere. We didn't even have forklifts back then, you know. We were just 100 kilo bales of cardboard. We were stacking them in a stairway fashion inside buildings by hand, you know, and you had to have 74 before you had a load. So you know you've just stacked seven and a half tonne of material by, you know, by hand. Someone bought in, I think, in the first couple of weeks, an old trailer to dump, and we thought, whoa, treasure. We've, we've got a yard trailer, you yeah. know. Yeah, nothing to power it um, or drag it about, but, you know, well, delight. We don't have to carry everything by hand from one side of the yard to the other. You might get a photo of that old tractor. That thing's been around here forever. We had a month where we had a hole in the radiator, but we couldn't afford the 100 bucks to fix it. So every time you turned it on, you had to pour in a few litres and then drive it with it spraying water over you. You know, you had no brakes. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> this is all right. You it's can, gone now, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. You know, had no brakes. You know, but we worked with it. I think we were, we were judged a bit on that as well, you know, there they are at the recycle centre with minimal equipment, are they really professional enough to uh, manage it in the future? We really tried to communicate to the community from the beginning about what we were trying to achieve, you know, yeah. <laughs> we weren't able to do it beautifully and as possible, you know, in the beginning. And, you know, I think the community had cut us a lot of slack. There was truckloads of charitable hours going into this. You know, there were times when management went without. It looked really imminent that we were just going to get scuttled. I remember thinking, man, we just might have to pick up and go home. Chief Executive said that he had um, just signed a contract and um, wouldn't be re requiring extreme waste to be doing any recycling um, out of Raglan anymore. Um, I, I just happened to um, be going downtown. I was at the community house and at the time there was a great power meeting. I just informed the administrator and she said, well, come on in here and tell these people. The um, Grey Power meeting for me was another turning point. They were so supportive of the work that we had been doing and there were some people there who had limited mobility who were saying to me, you tell me where he lives, I'm going to take my rubbish bags and drop it on his lawn. You just tell me. By that stage it was part of our identity. You know, when, people, when visitors came to town, you'd be talking to them about extreme waste. You know, you'd be talking to them about the employment that's created by this town, you know, recycling its waste. There was consternation and it, was, it wasn't was difficult for people just to pick up the phone. Community just rang him, you know, just got on the fax, got on the phone and just rang him and rang him and rang him and basically harangued the man till he, a couple of days later, ring, rang Rick. To say, call them off, tell them, you know, um, you know, just call them off. 
I said, look, it's nothing to do with me. They're actually speaking about something that's important to them and making sure that you're hearing them. He said, I've decided to cut Raglan off from the, the contract for the rest of the district. If it costs you more money, you can bloody well just handle that. You know, um, you, you know you're crazy not to accept this offer. He challenged us in the newspapers and, um, and he was very good at running uh, media campaigns. So um, rather than take him on, um, we just said how much we liked him and we um, welcomed him to our recycling team and we look forward to working with him in the future, which I think really pissed him off. It don't feel right Cause it ain't right I've been feeling this way Far too long It just ain't Despite the strong support from within the community so it's fair to say that not everyone in town was happy that they now had to sort and separate their rubbish. You get people turn up to the community board and argue about the waste portion of their um, rates and they'd add two rubbish bags for every week to that and say, what? that's way more than people pay in Narawakia, why am I paying that? And it's like, well, actually you're only paying that because you're not recycling. <laughs> By 2005, Extreme Waste had achieved its goal of 75% diversion from landfill. That same year, the council also published a survey that showed an 84% satisfaction rate in Raglan with the recycling services. By comparison, the national average was 60%, the district average 50%, and the poor folk in nearby Huntley were stuck on a mere 27%. Despite all this, council was still treating Extreme Waste like something stuck to the underside of its boot, and they were still hamstrung by the one-year contracts. If it wasn't for the local community who provided staunch support at council as well as a lot of volunteer labour, they would have been long gone. We did manage to get the forklift before we got the seven year contract, we got one forklift. So what did you do before you had a forklift? The tractor with no brakes. That was the winner, bro. <laughs> Designated drivers. Their arch-nemesis, CEO Warwick Bennett, had finally gone in 2004, and by that time the rest of the district had begun to demand recycling as well, so the new CEO appointed someone with a positive view of recycling to sort it all out. It was a move that would change everything for extreme waste. The first bits I heard were probably from the staff. It wasn't probably that complimentary in lots of ways, but certainly the idea and, and the ideals behind it appealed to me, so I was looking past those those issues and certainly when I went out there and met with the team out there and, and saw what the services are providing I thought wow this is this is great. Mm -hmm. What I saw as a relationship was that it was more with the staff. They had some frustrations and, and extreme wasted as well. And a lot of it, to my mind, came down to that very short term contract. It was very hand to mouth and so that every last dollar was being counted and fought over. Um, so it needed, to my mind, it needed to have a better base. And um, the only way really to do that would be to have a longer term contract. And how is the relationship with council now? I think it's excellent, Mia, I, I really do. There is no us in them. Council is, is a, another community organisation. They're able to trust us now because we have a good solid track record. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure um, working with Waikato District Council now. It's amazing. Quite a few other councils have contracted us for advice and that's been a beautiful thing to be able to share that story with councils and to have council engineers coming to us for advice it's almost like 
12 years we've gone full circle from being the unknowns and having no experience to um, having something that we can offer back. Who are you trying to lead to greatness? Where are you going to be when the ship goes down? The seven-year contract finally gave Extreme Waste a sense of security for the first time in their existence. It also gave them a chance to raise a loan and buy some decent equipment. But it wasn't to be long before a new danger was looming on the horizon. If you know Waiheke Island, 40 minutes by ferry from downtown Auckland, then you know the islanders like to do things their own way. And that's how they've been recycling. Waiheke recycles more than 40% of its rubbish. Now, to put that in context, we useless Aucklanders manage only 18%, less than half their rate. But now an Aussie-based multinational has been awarded the recycling contract. The council says it's cheaper and that makes it better. Bollocks, say Waiheke Islanders. Aaron Battenaga is the chairperson of the city development group that voted in favour of overseas company Trans-Pacific. What about community, though? This decision is supporting a multinational over a community who are doing a good job. Well, I think that the, the way I'd approach that is that um, you have Auckland ratepayers who are essentially subsidising the, um, uh, the, the outcome on, on Waiheke Island in terms of um, uh, having a, a more expensive manual system over there. That's an example of how bad the tendering process is when you look at a dollar versus the economic dollar. Not mentioned in the TV3 article was the fact that a MRF or materials recovery facility had just been built in Auckland. All these guys came in with a different collection system which is single bins. You know, to take it back to the MRF versus what Waiheke was doing sorting on the island. So you're saying that Cleanstream Waiheke couldn't compete with them? No, so again, it wasn't that they couldn't compete. They couldn't compete under that tendering model because the tendering model didn't factor in all these local benefits. The irony of this situation is that all this amazing technology can't actually sort the recycling as well as a real person can. Since that new system's come in, there's been very little glass has gone to OI that's usable in bottles and Carla Hole Harvey can't do anything with the paper because of the amount of glass that's in the paper. We need to be able to tell people that what they're doing is much, much poorer quality and much poorer standard than what's happening here in extreme waste. It's more effective, you get a better quality product, you get what they're calling real recycling through a process of slow recycling. Despite their poor results, MRFs are the preferred method of the corporate world, especially when the ratepayers pay for the construction. This is exactly what happened in Wanaka when Smart Environmental won out over another community recycler, Wanaka Waste Busters. They reduced the cost of processing Wanaka's recycling from 327,000 a year to a mere 10,000. That's right, that's a 96% reduction, and not surprisingly, there were accusations of predatory pricing. I'm devastated. It's frustrating. Time for a change in attitude and how we manage our communities. We had a similar situation last year with our contracts up here and we almost got to the point of losing them even though we'd done ticked all the boxes. We're the highest performing contractor our council has ever had and that's measurable. KPIs ticked off 100%, 100% for seven years. Came to the contract, we almost lost it. Why? Because of just this big is better. It's easy to say that one thing costs more than another without taking into account the whole story or the, or the socio-economic benefits, which is what we've been trying to um, push with this one, you know, for a long period of time. It's 20-odd, it's 23 people employed in Raglan. Well, there was one when we started. As well as the old council CEO taking an active dislike to extreme waste, the Raglan Community Board chairperson from 2004 to 2010, Peter Storey, was also very opposed to extreme waste and complained that they were ripping off the community. He changed his mind about appearing in the film, but a 2009 article in the Waikato Times spelled out his views. From this it can be seen that like some confused residents back when extreme waste started, he was still basing his calculations on the cost for households that were not recycling. By way of comparison, families that took their recycling seriously had been putting out one blue bag a month for almost a decade and paying less than a third of the $314 a year that Mr Storey quoted for the Times. Because of his efforts, many people in Raglan to this day still believe that extreme waste overcharges. And since economics was the reason given for Mr Storey's attempts to oppose extreme waste, we talked to some experts about what they thought the existence of extreme waste meant economically for Raglan. I did a specific study actually for MFE on the benefits 
of um, working with community groups rather than commercial companies for, for councils. If you have a community group doing such work for you, those people are driven, so they'll do you 150%. And, but they'll also nag the council for more money for new schemes because they're keen to get on with things. A, a company will come along and they will contract to do X, they will do X, they will take the money and export it out of the district. Let's look at extreme waste, right? The administration base, all their employment is local. They spend a lot of their services local. They have very small capital requirements. So they have very little money going out of the Raglan community. And then what they end up doing is bringing a lot of money in through sale of the products in the reuse. We took a look at Extreme Waste 2012 accounts and sure enough, despite being paid 380000 by the Raglan ratepayers, they actually spent 660000 back into the community. This means Raglan benefited to the tune of $280,000 in 2012. The approach of larger waste companies is um, high capital, low labour. You know, there might be one person driving the truck, but the truck might be worth $300,000, whereas Extreme Waste, we have four people on the track, and so we've got high labour and low capital, so our truck would be worth like $13,000. So let's see how many of Extreme Waste's current staff would be required with a corporate waste contract. There would be no need for management, research or education staff. You could certainly say goodbye to the woodyard and anything else that makes a loss. And you can also say goodbye to the entire street pickup team, since all that work will be centralised to a depot in Hamilton. This would leave work for 4.3 equivalent full-time staff. Remembering that Extreme Waste spends $660,000 locally, that low number of employees under a corporate waste contract would lead to a local spend of only $180,000 and instead of a sizeable gain, the Raglan ratepayers would have made a loss of 187000 in 2012. The final word on the economic benefits to Raglan goes to the Community Employment Group who studied this exact issue in 2004. They showed that because of the flow and effects of spending that money locally, that original $380,000 creates a stimulus to the local economy of between $1.6 and $2.8 million. If it's regarded as an investment, then every single person in this town is getting a really good return on that investment. Of course, they're getting jobs, they're getting a more stable community, they've got more services because extreme waste exists. That's good. That'll give me a good challenge. I came to Raglan 13 years ago, you, you gave a talk and then went away and left Raglan to it. And now you come back a decade and a half later yeah. and Extreme Waste is in, in this position. I mean, how does it feel? I think it's extraordinary. You guys have got some sort of magic that we, that we can only dream of. There's a lot of things infused within Raglan that have come from the ethos of that group. The culture that exists here, to me at least, has been created by the organisations that exist here, like Extreme Waste. Organisations that are not just people talking, they're about people doing. If we learn how to use our economic indicators correctly, you can't help but show the benefits of that sort of an enterprise. I think they get to where they've got now, 10 years later. I had no doubt in my mind. We weren't mucking around. <laughs> we didn't, you know, we were busting our backs in, in the belief that we, would, we could do something. We didn't have any idea that it was going to get as, be as successful as it was and the the support that came at some critical times from community was, you know, inspired us as well. Extreme waste wouldn't be, wouldn't be, if it wasn't for community. Are you glad you did it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I would have, I would have done it all again. I would have done it all again in exactly the same way that we did it. It's about the people that put it together. 
because it was a really, a really caring bunch of people. It's been really, really interesting and really satisfying and really hard work, but really fun and really um, heartwarming and has bound us into you know, an amazing community of people. Extreme Waste and other examples of community enterprise around the country have actually gone through some incredibly lean periods. But we don't do it for profit, we do it for our community, we do it for cultural and social and environmental reasons. Therefore when times get tough you just keep going, you just keep working at it. There is um, probably even more of a reason to, to um, pull your sleeves up and get into it. Monday and Tuesday peeps, if you could just rinse and take the lids off your containers, it would be so much more better than not having them off. <laughs> 